All right, guys, let's, uh, let's, let's get started. Thank you very much, Dave. I think in the spirit of uh, Seinfeld, maybe I should stop now and thanks everybody and, and leave it when I'm at my height. Um, so I became a bit nervous when I understood that uh, I'm going to talk at the Kelvin Hall, at the Kelvin Building, and the place where Kelvin worked, and, and give this title of re Rethinking Carbon Fixation. Um, but um, this is what I'm going to talk about in a way. But actually, I, 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 even though I'll be talking, I can blame my students because it's really mostly their work. So it's really what I'll be talking about is mostly the brainchild of two fantastic graduate students, Aaron Bar Evan and Del Adnu, which I hope you have the opportunity to meet either by them coming here or you coming over. And so a question that has been fascinating me for a long time was this question of what limits maximal growth rates in biology? Let's take, for example, our friend E. coli, and we're doing like the kind of experiment of putting it every night in this uh, heavenly medium of LB and let it grow in these perfect conditions. And it divides roughly every 20 minutes. And you can ask yourself, why every 20 minutes? Why not every 10 minutes or every 5 minutes? Even if these are not the, the environment it's used to in our gut, it's definitely something that has been running over in, in, in many, many labs throughout the world for a very long time. And still we don't see such a thing evolving. And so this question of the, of the speed limit on growth rate is something that's very interesting because that would be the ultimate fitness advantage, right? That would, if there was an option to do it, it would overtake the population really quickly. And you can ask that not only in the context of, of bacteria, you can also ask that in the context of, say, eukaryotic cells, so there, the fastest I could find is something like 60 or 70 minutes in some type of yeast. You can ask it for mammalian cells, and there you can find some cell lines that have been pushed to something like 10 hours division cycle. But why not faster? And then I'm most interested in the context, not of all of those t types of parasites that are based on the fact that we're adding something to the medium, but let's think about photosynthetic organisms that are only starting from the sunlight. And there, the fastest I could find are indications of something like three hours per cell cycle for some type of specific algae. So what governs those, those uh, speed limits? So that's a question that I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in. And I would say in general that I, I didn't find complete closed answers for any of those, even for E. coli. And if anyone's interested, we could discuss further some of those interesting issues. 
So in trying to understand that, that also leads to some other issues, trying to find the interaction. I, here I know many people are very well aware of it, but when thinking about carbon fixation, uh, it's such an interesting process because we could study it in the lab microscopically, but it has such huge uh, global effects in terms of the land resources that uh, humanity uses, in terms of the water resources, in terms of affecting the, the content of our atmosphere. For all of those reasons, the, our lab is very much interested in that. And so what we've been trying to do in the, in the past three, three years was trying to take sort of like holistic view of sort of like trying to understand something that are related to those uh, speed limits, these of enzymes, in terms of the kinetic rates, in terms of their affinities, so all of those things and how, they, how the how architecture of, of metabolic pathways are structured. Can we gain in some insight into the logic of why is glycolysis built the way it is, why is uh, respiration built the way it is, and anyone interested, uh, again, I'll be happy to, to talk with you after and, and, and give some specific pointers. And then in the context of, of, uh, of photosynthesis itself, uh, we've been looking, so here you see a schematics of, of the chloroplast, and there, starting from photons from the sun, we were interested in the issue of, the, of what you find in terms of the energetics of the uh, wavelengths being utilized in photosynthesis. But the main focus of my talk today would be what happens in the dark reactions when we're looking in the process of taking carbon dioxide and giving us sugars. And there, one thing is looking at the properties of Rubisco, the carboxylating enzyme that does that. Uh, but mostly I'll be looking at the issue of thinking about how can one consider alternatives to the Calvin-Benson uh, pathway of doing carbon fixation. Uh, I should have said in the beginning, usually I, I, I tend to strive to the fact that at least 80% of the people will understand 80% of what I'm saying. So if you feel that you're moving into the 20%, it's probably because I didn't explain myself so well. So please don't wait until the end to tell me that I was using some term that wasn't clear. Feel free to ask uh, all along, okay? Okay. Any chance we have another pointer like this? It seems like the battery is out. Okay. So uh, the Calvin cycle, uh, again, so speaking of this whole, I feel, uh, I feel a bit nervous about talking about it. But just uh, the issues that uh, I just want to remind us is that we're taking uh, carbon dioxide, so it's really the gateway between the inorganic world and the organic world, really exciting point to be in thinking about the effects on the, on the biosphere. Uh, and this key carboxylating enzyme, Rubisco, has been studied to death, tons and tons of grants being written for decades in trying to improve it with very limited success. And so we think today that we have more insight into why is that and all sorts of trade-offs that are at the bottom of, of, of the limitation. It seems like it might actually, even though it's usually considered as slow, it might actually be optimal in terms of underlying uh, constraints. But this definitely, thanks a lot. So this led us to, to say, okay, if we're quite limited in trying to improve Rubisco by itself, let's try and ask the question, can we find alternative ways in order to do carbon fixation that do not necessarily rely on using Rubisco or doing it in the normal way. So let me just point out in that respect that there are, there are alternatives of doing carbon fixation. For example, there's this thing called the reductive TCA cycle. So we all know about the TCA cycle that is being used. So there's a way if you're an organism, a photosynthetic organism that has lots of energy, you can run that in reverse and fix carbon in that way. So there are alternative ways of doing it. And also let me point out, it's not that we're any smarter than Mother Nature in coming up with such bright solutions. We do know that when the constraints are different, sometimes the solutions are different. So for example, in, uh, in agriculture, we know that throughout the generations, we've been changing the properties, and it's not necessarily that we were any smarter, it's just that we had different requirements. So for example, the maize that we're, uh, that we're using today is very different from the teosinte that was originally uh, propagating itself, but then it was trying to deal with the fact of having as many progeny as possible, whereas we're trying to optimize having an ear of corn that would be as big as possible. So when the constraints are different, you can get different solutions, and we think that maybe also in the context of this process of carbon fixation, we could consider the same issue. And in any case, we also want to try and test our understanding of what happens in metabolic pathways, what are the limits on the productivity, the rates of these of this process. So this is definitely something that we hope to achieve by, by what I'll be showing you in a minute. And so what we try to do is try and do, so like, a, a, to build a computational framework in order to try and be able to try and explore the space of possibilities of ways to achieve carbon fixation. So the logic goes that you, you're saying, 
let me take the, the freedom to take all of the known enzymes known to science today, there's about 5,000 of them, each was characterized in terms of what substrate it takes and what products does it give, and try and see what would be the range of possibilities of arranging them together in ways that would be as good as possible in terms of running the process of starting from inorganic carbon and giving you as product something that, let's say, could fit into glycolysis, some kind of sugar. So it's a mix and match approach, so you can allow yourself, at least at, at this stage, the freedom of using it from different organisms. Although there would be all sorts of associated problems, of course, with compartmentalization, with pH, ionic strength, temperature, you name it, we could talk about that later. But at this uh, point, let's allow ourselves the freedom for that. And so in order to try and do that, uh, we developed a, a computational framework. Actually, it was an interesting contest between uh, uh, Aaron bar Evan, which I've shown you, a brilliant biochemist that was trying to do it in his head, and El Adno, which was trying to uh, teach the computer to do it. And this was evolved in order to try and solve this problem. And in trying to find solutions, we, at every time, uh, need to evaluate those pathways. And this evaluation is at the heart of the matter, because really saying that you're interested in the best possible pathway is ill-defined. You have to say, what are you, what are you referring to? So what, are we, what, what did we look at in our analysis? On the one hand, we looked at issues that are related to energetics and thermodynamics. But, so that, that was one thing that were, was of interest to us. There was also the issue of how uh, this is compatible into the other uh, pathways that are existing inside the cell. But what seemed to be the most important thing that we pay the most attention to is the issue of kinetics of the pathway. And that is because if you think about the cell resources uh, required, if you take one of the beautiful trees that you have on campus today, and I really enjoyed them when I was walking around, you can find in a, in a, in a leaf that you can have up to 50% of the soluble protein being involved in the process of carbon fixation which means that if you were able to free up some of those resources because you now have faster rate, then you might be able to free up lots of resources for doing other things and maybe increase the productivity, or otherwise you might be, it might be enabling to work with less uh, investment, say in terms of nitrogen uh, inputs or other inputs. And so let me show you an example of why it's important to, to look at those uh, different metrics. Because here is one example of, of a solution that the computer could find in order to, order to take, so you have two steps here to take carbon dioxide. In only four steps, it releases glyoxylate, and glyoxylate could be turned into uh, a, a free carbon relatively easily. So this is definitely simpler than the Calvin Benson cycle in terms of the number of steps. Instead of like these 13 steps and this uh, very sophisticated stoichiometry, here is something much simpler. But there are problems with that which exemplify the, the requirement to look at different issues. So one is the fact that in terms of thermodynamically, this would be infeasible in the sense that uh, instead of running in this direction of, of fixing carbon, it would actually be running in the reverse direction, kind of like the TCA cycle, releasing carbon dioxide and giving us ATP and reducing power, which is actually might be interesting by itself, but not for the purposes of what we were trying to look here. So this is why we were interested in thermodynamics. But you know how it goes, thermodynamics, many people tell me, yeah, I learned it in undergrad, I never really understood what, what was happening there, I don't know if I take it seriously, are there any other reasons why I should, why I should care? So we take thermodynamics very seriously, as I'll show you in a minute, but there are other issues as well, which also shows why this is not the only issue. For example, even if you have a pathway which is much shorter, it might still be, in terms of kinetics, much slower, because it's all about, it might be that some of the steps are so slow that they even slower than a few steps in the Calvin Benson cycle. So this is actually true for, for this specific pathway. And then finally, in some cases, the mechanism is such that it could be oxygen sensitive, which might mean that it's an interesting pathway, but would not probably, only anaerobically, and probably would not see any, uh, any widespread utilization anytime soon. Okay, so if I mentioned uh, thermodynamics, I just want to mention uh, one thing that might be useful for some of you. So anyone who tried to analyze uh, thermodynamics of pathways, it's very, very difficult in terms of finding the information. So I had the pleasure of, of uh, having a brilliant student, Avi Flemholtz, that was uh, coming to my lab from, from the US after working at Google, and he developed a framework of being able to take any pathway that you're interested in, or an enzyme, and getting all the information on its, on its uh, uh, thermodynamic processes. 
in, in terms of, for example, the delta G of reaction, the delta G of formation, you can plug in here, you just write in free text, you know, Rubisco, and you get the, the associated thermodynamics. You can do, uh, you know, fermentation of glucose or anything else. So if anyone interested, just uh, Google equilibrator or wait till uh, Avi starts his uh, graduate school just here in Berkeley in just a few months and you can ask him uh, directly. Uh, it's a big loss to the lab, by the way. I think you'll all enjoy interacting with him. Okay, so this is about thermodynamics for anyone who's interested for analyzing a pathway. And then let me tell you what happened in this, in this sort of like uh, interesting competition that was happening between the, the, the ability of doing it in the human mind of thinking about alternative pathways and the computer uh, being taught uh, to do pathways. So in the beginning, every time there was a solution to the computer, uh, Elad would show it to Aaron, and Aaron would just laugh and say, hey, I did that you know, months ago. This would not work or not be interesting because of reason A, B, and C. But then one day, it was uh, pretty nice. We were sitting for lunch, and I got this uh, message that actually now running the, 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 the algorithm and giving Rubisco as the carboxylating enzyme, the solution the computer came up with as the best solution is the Calvin-Benson cycle. So we've been scooped by nature in you know, like, like 3 billion years. We've been scooped by Kelvin by like a century. But for us, it was still rewarding because anyone who, who remembers the stoichiometry of everything involved, it's not like something you would come up with as, you know, very trivially. So it, it conveyed to us the sense that maybe we're getting close in terms of implementing in the, so like the logic of biochemistry the computer tries to, to learn, something that might be of interest. And the question now is what happens, not under the case where you, uh, by necessity, tell it, let's use Rubisco as the carboxylate thing, and what would happen if you give it all the freedom in the world to take anything out of the known metabolic enzymes known to science? Okay, so we're not inventing, like, you're not taking just like any general mechanisms or something theoretical. These are all enzymes that are known, that have been measured. So let me show you the, the most promising pathway that we found uh, computationally. So this is this pathway. I won't get into all the details of it, but let me point some highlights. So what you have here is basically the best known carboxylating enzyme uh, known to science is this PEP carboxylase, which takes bicarbonate and transform phosphorinyl pyruvate to oxaloacetate. So this is the, the key step of, the, of moving from the inorganic world to the organic world. And then one needs to find a way in order to recreate the substrate while producing, uh, giving out uh, something that could be used as a sugar. So we have a, step of, uh, a series of steps here that g results in glyoxylate as a product from two such carboxylation, carboxylation reactions, and this could lead afterwards uh, to, the, to the product. Where, while also closing the cycle to give you back pyruvate. Yes? Right, so, so you're asking about C4 plants, I, I, I think. So yeah, that's definitely something I, I, I wanted to get into. So this might look familiar to some of you, this transformation from pyruvate to phosphonyl pyruvate to oxaloacetate to malate. That's exactly what some of the most uh, productive plants we're utilizing, such as sugarcane and maize, is utilizing. So let me say a word about it in just a second. But just to finish the description of that, so this happens in C4 plants, but the rest does not happen in C4 plants. And this pathway is predicted, according to the best estimate that we're able to do today, to be several times faster when we're comparing it to the Kelvin-Benson cycle, and hence our interest and excitement about what it might be uh, able to achieve. And in terms of its thermodynamics and energetics, it's quite comparable. And also in terms of uh, it imposes relatively little changes in terms of the overall uh, changes in fluxes. And so as you pointed out, uh, this, this part is exactly what happens in C4, uh, C4 plants. Utilizing this module uh, of, 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 of this, so again, we've been scooped by nature. Uh, but then what happens in nature is that this uh, malate is then being moved into an inner uh, cell where the carbon dioxide is being released. And actually, this whole thing serves as some sort of a pump or some sort of a futile cycle, but that, re that releases carbon dioxide next to Rubisco such that it could increase uh, the local concentration so that it works better both in terms of rate and in terms of specificity because of its uh, also tendency to also react with oxygen and with quite uh, some implications for the cell. So effectively, what we're able to achieve in this, in this uh, cycle 
is basically instead of instead of closing the cycle and releasing the carbon dioxide, actually to close it such that you the the, the hard one uh, carbon dioxide that was uh, that was fixed is actually uh, being exported in a form that's easy to transform and get into glycolysis. So when look at the components involved here, uh, many of the enzymes are so like run of the mill that you can find you know in E. coli or in cells in your body or in Arabidopsis. So that's for many of the enzymes. For other enzymes, they're much more uh, uh, exotic or appear in just a few specific uh, species. Um, uh, as you can see here, and we don't know, maybe actually this already exists in nature, just nobody knows about it, because some of those six pathways that does carbon fixation, like two of them were just discovered in the past decade, two other were uh, discovered in the decade before that, so who knows, maybe it exists somewhere, or maybe because of these uh, different niches, maybe it's hard to find the place where all of these come together, we actually do not know, or maybe it just can't work, but in order to test it, that's a, that's a big challenge. We, with because we were very interested in this whole process of trying to test on the computer the space of possibilities. And this solution seemed to us to be very elegant and interesting. But now our appetite became, uh, became larger. So one option is to consider trying to build this in vitro. Um, so just purifying those enzymes and trying to put them together. For those of you who do so like in vitro things on metabolic pathways, know that's way above what we could expect to be successful in trying to do these days. But this is definitely one avenue of trying to approach it. But then you know, even if you're successful, probably you send it and the referees come back to you and say, oh, that's very beautiful, now you did in vitro, maybe you also do it in vivo. Uh, so I think it's very interesting uh, to try and, and do that uh, in vivo. It's, it's way beyond our capabilities in the lab today. And uh, we had some discussions with people here about maybe possibilities of trying to do it with people who are experts in this field. Uh, but let me try and tell you some of the first baby steps that we're taking in the direction of trying to implement uh, things related to carbon fixation. And so in, in trying to, in, to, to be interested in trying to test some of those predictions, we were looking for a model system where we were able to play around with carbon fixation and see if we're able to tweak the, uh, such issues. And so what we decided to try and do is try to take as our model system E. coli and try to see if we could make an E. coli that would do carbon fixation, so an autotrophic E. coli. So, and this is very much related to the work that uh, you know Dave Savage did in a recent uh, very interesting PNAS paper of expressing uh, such things in E. coli in carboxysomes. And what we're trying to achieve here is basically taking, uh, even though the Calvin cycle is built on many, many, on like 13 enzymes, uh, the situation, even though it's going to be very challenging to turn E. coli into being completely autotrophic, it could have been much, much worse. Why is that? Because uh, the basis of, of the Calvin-Benson cycle is on the uh, on, uh, gluconeogenesis of glycolysis, as well as the pentose phosphate pathway, the pathway that transforms six carbon sugars into five carbon sugars. And these things together mean that in theory, all you need in order to be able to have a functional, to close the cycle, is to express these two proteins, Rubisco, that I already mentioned, the carboxylating enzyme, and PRK, the enzyme that builds the substrate for Rubisco. But that would not give us a, a, an, an E. coli that's able to do carbon fixation by itself, because it's not a photosynthetic E. coli, right? That would be really completely crazy. Uh, we're talking here about we also need to supply it with an energy source, right? That might enable it to get a carbon source, so we're supplying it with an energy source in the form that's something that it can't use uh, as, as a carbon source, but could utilize it in order to take the electrons and through respiration get its ATP as well as uh, NADH. So this is, the, uh, this is the approach we're trying to take. And except for this uh, external energy source, we need a lot more energy, and that's the human energy involved. So these are some of the students involved in that. Uh, Niv Antonovsky was leading some of those uh, numbers of efforts together with Leo and Shira, uh, uh, trying to, to really uh, teach E. coli to move to this uh, new mode of diet. And so in trying to do that, uh, we've been expressing those genes, and we had problems that maybe would look not unfamiliar to you of toxicity. Especially, it seems, from the expression of this uh, enzyme P PRK. And it seems like in general, when you have a metabolic pathway and you want to get a significant flux there, you might have a problem. Let me try and exemplify that, tell you how, we, how we're solving that problem. And maybe I think it could be useful for some of the people here as well. 
So let's take as an example here, this is a model of a, of a, of a path, a simplified pathway. You have some substrate, an intermediate, and a product. And the, the two enzymes, even though we claim to understand a lot about enzymes, etc., and pathways, we know we're close to really understanding, usually, what are the exact amounts required of things. So let us show what could be the problems. So if the levels are too low, you might have low flux. If you express them very strongly, you know, from like strong promoters, you're starting to have all sorts of problems of protein burden where now the cells might not be growing well. If you express one but not enough of the other, you're starting to have intermediate accumulation that very often could be toxic. So there's usually some sort of a, of a sweet spot here that you want to be in terms of like a balanced pathway. But being able to get to that sweet spot is very difficult because, you know, the gradient suit builds this, it takes a while, and then you clone just one option, it doesn't work out, what do you do? You have to do it again, and every cycle could take you a very long time. So you'd like to find a way in order to spend that space in some more uh, effective way. And the way we, we, we're doing that uh, is by using RBSs, ribosome binding sites, in a way following uh, the work uh, done by uh, the lab of Chris Voigt, where they've been showing how you can take ribosome binding sites and with that in around with the levels. So what we did is we took a, a specific set of like six different ribosome binding sites that are spanning, as you can see here, something like three orders of magnitude in this case between, so this is log 10 of the level of expression. So if you have this RBSA, you usually have something that's very strong in terms of expression. The ribosome binds there almost all the time very strongly. Whereas if you have this, uh, this uh, weak RBS, you have something that's several orders of magnitude uh, weaker. And by that, you can really play around it. So like you have these knobs here. Now, the neat thing is that if you want to play with a pathway, the thing is there are lots and lots of possibilities. So what uh, Lior and the Niv came up with is they said, okay, we'll build this combinatorial uh, method, both of the cloning and implementing it, such that in each location along the pathway, we'll play around with these six options. And six options, then again six options, then six options, you have six to the n alternatives that you might be scanning at the same time because you can grow many, many colonies of bacteria. So in order to prove that, they said, okay, we could uh, try and, and do the following. Let's take three fluorescent proteins, and basically we could build something like a bacterial TV because it's like an RGB. So we don't have a bacterial TV, but let me show you what we did come up with. So this is a basically just an operon where in each location, R2 and 3, they're just putting those, uh, those RBSs. And of course, you can do it all in parallel because you just uh, take and mix them together, all of the options. So you have six to the three options. Uh, and so the first time they did that, put it under the microscope, I was hardly involved, and then they showed me this uh, picture of the result of what you're getting, which are basically colonies here, and because they're almost touching each other, you can see these funny morphologies. But what I want to, to look at is so like the different colors that you see here, which to us indicated that actually you do get here this variability in terms of the levels of expression inside the pathway. Right, so if you have red, it usually means that you had a strong RBS here and relatively weak RBSs here, whereas if you had blue, it means that this RBS was relatively strong, whereas other were relatively weak. Here you can see, for example, what happens when you, know, you grow many more of the cells. In this specific case, it was nice because you can see one colony just out here, and then many different colonies with all the variability that you get. And you can look at what happens, for example, with three RBSs, so you have altogether like 27 options. And you can take an image of each one of them and see the, the range of like how they spend the spectra of colors depending on the levels of those RGB. And in terms of spanning, you can see what, what happens in, the in terms of levels of expression. So here on the x-axis, you have the YFP fluorescence. In terms of the red axis, you have uh, on the y-axis, you have M cherry. And you can see the letters here refer to the type of RBSs you have here. And you can see that it really creates a grid in expression space which somehow enables you to spend the different levels, even if you don't know what you're uh, aiming at. Uh, the slopes here, by the way, refer to an interesting, we didn't expect that, but it's actually related to a phenomenon known as translational coupling, which means that if you have an operon, when you're changing the first gene, you make it stronger, it somehow miraculously also affects the second gene in the operon, even though you didn't play around with the ribosome binding site or anything else. And there are still disputes of why this happens, but we see the signal of that quite clearly. Okay, so what this, uh, why did I tell you all of that? First of all, because that really enabled us to solve the problem of toxicity, because the toxicity that we had, now that we express things with different RBSs, we had colonies that were forming, because these were combinations where within the level was such that there wasn't a problem of toxicity. 
So that's why it was useful for us. But I think maybe I thought that maybe because of the interest of some of the people here, it might be useful for you for other pathways trying to optimize yield or flux and, and other things as well. And again, if anyone's interested in more details on that, I'll be happy uh, to give them. Okay, so with all of that, um, what, uh, what did we get? We were able to express uh, Rubisco and PRK uh, from different organisms in E. coli. And then we were interested to try and see whether we get any activity. So for that, we were using uh, the CO2 following the footprint of how Kelvin did it with C14, but now we did it with C13. And basically, we were trying to see if we could get the product that will be labeled that actually you start to have a reaction where you're getting uh, this activity. And so we're doing it uh, with the help of Asafa Aroni Lab, who are uh, experts in, uh, in LCMS. And what you see here are the results of looking at the ratio between uh, glycerate 3 phosphate that's uh, labeled with C13 versus C12, and the ratio of about 40 to 60. So in ideal conditions, because you're starting with a 5 carbon sugar, you're adding another CO2 that's labeled, and it breaks down into two 3 carbon sugars, the ideal ratio would be like 50-50. So 60-40 is not that far, far off, and we're quite happy with that. But that uh, gave us more appetite, so now we're interested to see if you can get more of that, not only the last step, but even to see if the PRK that is not usually uh, uh, functional, what you have in E. coli, whether this expression is also functional. So you're starting with ribose 5-phosphate, and again you're testing what happens, and again you get a significant fraction that's labeled with C13, which indicates to us that these things which are expressed are also functional. Since, and, and since then, we also moved into looking at what happens at the total biomass of the cell. And what we're seeing that even uh, for now, we're still growing it together with some other carbon source, like succinate or acetate that's in the medium. We already see that you can get uh, something like 3% of the biomass being labeled as, as carbon-13, uh, uh, which is several times higher than the normal uh, endogenous levels which indicates to us that this is, might also be closing the cycle altogether and not only these steps. And now the, the challenge for us is to try and do the evolutionary steps of trying to really uh, remove the level of, of, carbon, di of, uh, of uh, carbon that we're supplying to the cells and see if we could actually achieve E. coli that's wholly uh, autotrophic. And I hope that maybe on the next visit I could update on that. Okay, so uh, wrapping up, I want to so like, uh, so like look back at, at what we're trying to achieve here. On the one hand, I was telling you about the computational framework in order to try and so like explore the possibilities with existing enzymes of building pathways of interest. I was showing it for carbon fixation, but the, I think the methodology could be of interest to apply it for other things. Maybe you're inter interested in nitrogen fixation or in some other pathway of interest. Maybe some of those things could be borrowed to other fields as well. We came up with some uh, alternatives for, uh, for synthetic pathways for carbon fixation that might be of interest. And in order to be able to try and think about how to test them, uh, we're trying to develop a way to have E. coli, which is autotrophic, where, you can, where you're plugging in a carbon fixation pathway. And then maybe you can also try and replace it with one of the synthetic carbon fixation pathways and compare them under conditions that are maybe more fair than trying to take, say, an algae uh, which already does carbon fixation and so like integrate it for millions of years and trying to replace it all together with something else that probably wouldn't be any better in the short term. We're a division that this would be useful you know, as a community in order to try and uh, be able to affect our productivity in things like agriculture or alternatively in order to be able to store alternative energy uh, through such uh, processes. Um, to finish up, this is roughly what I wanted to tell you, but I want to mention uh, something. As you can imagine, for most of the analysis that we're doing, um, oh, but before I, I mention that, just one more second, let me point out that even though we're hoping to achieve all of that, uh, it's clear to us that we'll be, it, it will be proven that Ogle saying that evolution is smarter than you are will definitely be true also for our efforts. So not everything that we plan would pan out exactly that way. But uh, I think it's fair that uh, that's part of what we, they pay us as scientists is only to try and, and just do these things. And if we fail, we hope that in the process of failing, we'll still be learning very interesting uh, lessons about all sorts of issues, about metabolic pathways, about the limits on, on, on productivity. In a way, you could think about this whole process sort of like an experiment about horizontal gene transfer. You took E. coli, you put it in a new environment. It doesn't have the common sources it's used to, but then you so it somehow got by horizontal gene transfer 
the required components in order to be able to do carbon fixation, will it be able to adapt and under what conditions would this horizontal gene transfer would be uh, successful in adapting to this new niche? And so for all of those things where we have this uh, tendency to like numbers in biology and to try and understand uh, how they affect the biology, and for that we develop bio numbers, which they uh, briefly mentioned. So if you're interested to know uh, how many ATPs does it take to make an E. coli, what's the, uh, what's the volume of the, of the nucleus of a yeast cell uh, that makes our beer, or how many taste buds would enable you to enjoy dinner uh, in, uh, in not long ago, you can go and check it out. Uh, just write bio numbers in Google. Um, together with Rob Phillips, we were setting up a, a sort of like a, a, a one pager about the numbers that we hopefully believe like uh, every molecular biologist should know, numbers that are useful and interesting in relation to cell sizes in terms of energetics, in terms of rates. And so you can go and check that out as well. And uh, I think I already mentioned Niamh and Elad and Aaron. Here are some of the other people involved in doing the work in the lab. Um, I don't know if you uh, get to that, but if by any chance you're anywhere near the Middle East, you're welcome to come over to the Weizmann Institute and, uh, and come visit. We'll be happy to uh, have you as visitors. Thank you very much. So, so, so currently what, what, we, what we're doing is uh, we're using formate as our source of, of, uh, of electrons. So we're expressing in the E. coli formate dehydrogenase and fitting it with formate, which could not be used as a carbon source in E. coli. And that gives the, the uh, that transforms formate into CO2, which is being released, and then takes NAD and transforms it into NADH. Once the E. coli have the NADH, it has the electrons, and also through respiration gets the ATP. So this is how, so we show that we have good specific activity. Uh, uh, we've been able to show how this affects the physiology of the cell, such that you're getting better growth rate and better yields. Uh, this is all when there's also other carbon sources at the same time. And uh, now the big challenge is, uh, is for us, and we're running experiments on that, on seeing that just formate together with the, uh, with uh, bubbling CO2 would enable him to grow autotrophically. Uh, regarding the, the other part of your question, uh, the ability to do it in an electrotrophic way just by supplying the electrons from electrodes or through hydrogen, that's very exciting. I know other people are working along those lines. We're also interested in that. That probably would be uh, a, a further and more advanced uh, goal of trying to go in that direction. So, so in, in, in what we're doing here, it's hard for us to say what we, so the things that we characterize right now is things like the, the formate dehydrogenase that we were utilizing, the, the things related to Rubisco. So we're not yet at the stage where we could talk about the kinetics, for example, of the whole pathway. Uh, I hope that we'll get to there, but it's, I just don't have information on that at this time. Okay, so this I would say is sort of like one of the, the, the grand challenges we're trying to, to, to head to. So in terms of photosynthetic organism, it depends on the, on, the con on the environmental conditions. So sometimes it could be limited by nutrients, sometimes you're limited by, you know, by something else. But it seems to us that in many cases where you supply these things, you might be limited exactly by these processes of the carbon fixation. That like if you take you know, such a significant fraction of the proteins inside the leaf, you can't have now a faster uh, a larger flux because you can't have 100% all of your proteins doing just that. You need ribosomes, you need other things inside the cell. So it seems that in many cases the fact that, for example, the light reactions saturate might not be because of just problem with the light reactions, but actually because feeding those electrons downstream could not be taken quickly enough through the, the, the Calvin-Benson cycle. So this is what led us to think that the issue there, or the, the one of the, the uh, the thing that limits the, the speed of, of, the, of the growth is exactly in the issue of the, of the dark reactions, and that led us to try and, and, and make that better. 
So that's in the context of, of, uh, of photosynthetic organism. In the context of, say, bacteria like E. coli, it grows every 20 minutes. So asking this question, I was sure that, you know, I'll just open the right textbook and everybody would tell me why is it growing every 20 minutes and not any faster. Uh, I didn't yet find that textbook. Uh, I would say two lines of argument that might be of interest, in, but none of them solves the problem completely. One is if you look at the fraction of ribosomes. As you increase the growth rate, the fraction of ribosome increases. Already at 20 minutes, you could have about a third of the, of the proteome being ribosomal uh, uh, proteins. And it seems like they're, you know, increasing it much further becomes uh, problematic. But it's not really clear. Maybe if you were able to make the ribosomes faster, you wouldn't have that problem. On the other side is the question of the, of the replication of the genome, which is another line of argument that is sometimes being given. If you look at the rate, it would, at the time it would take uh, uh, E. coli to replicate its genome with uh, DNA polymerase, it's actually interesting. It's something like 50 minutes. That's uh, if you just take, you know, 5 billion base pairs, 1,000 base pairs per second is the rate which the uh, replisome runs at. So 5 million divided by 1,000 is like 5,000 seconds. You have two replisomes, like 2,500 uh, seconds. So that's actually twice or more than twice longer than the cell cycle. So how could that be? So that was solved way uh, ago because the origin of replication is such that you're already starting to make not only the daughter cells, but the granddaughter cells and the grand granddaughter cells by firing from the origin several times. But then maybe uh, this topology be becomes quite complicated with circles within circles of, of replication of the origin. Maybe there's a limit there in terms of how many you can do of these types. Uh, so these are two lines of argument. None of them, I think, is completely convincing uh, or really settles the question. So if somebody else knows better, I'll be happy to hear. So, 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 so that definitely one of the issues and challenges whenever you're trying to analyze the biological system and you're trying to take, you know, something, so like take it out of context and try to analyze it, especially if you're trying to do some modeling and playing around with the numbers to try and analyze it. So definitely biology is more complicated than what we're able to, to, to convey in any such analysis. But the question is whether it, I, I think to me, is whether it captures so like some of the main driving forces that are relevant for the problem at hand. So it's not like, that, it's not like we're saying we're modeling completely how a cell behaves. It's like we're trying to just find out what are the main driving forces or trends that are shaping things like either the maximal growth rate or the rate uh, that's limiting the fluxes. And for that, we'll have to prove whether it works or not. But that's usually what models might be useful for, which you then need to test. Okay, so, 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 okay, so, so we actually, we, we're a bit drifted here from, from what we're actually doing. So, so uh, what, 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 what we, let me just wrap up what we were talking. I was starting with like a general question about what limits growth rate. For E. coli, I don't know the answer, but I was just saying some of the things that have been discussed, it might be relevant to that. So that, and I was doing some speculation here. I didn't play around with, you know, disabling checkpoints here or sorts of things like that. Okay, so how does this work? There's the, there's the answer of what I know now and the answer that I hope I'll have soon. So the answer of what I know now is that we, we did it. We, in the beginning, we did it, and because of toxicity problem, it didn't work out. And then we started developing this RBS method, and then we did it, and then it worked out in the sense that we had colon, some colonies that were growing, and we started utilizing them, and then we could easily sequence them in order to know what it is. Now we also have this fancy Avi, the, the guy who's coming here, develop a nice uh, method to barcode it in this smart way that everything, you can know the whole operon in a very uh, nice way. Um, so this solved the problem. Now what we're trying to do is really do it more methodically in order to see if you really check all the possibilities to try and understand. And this, we're actually working on this these days and I don't have results yet. 
So the answer on that, so we, we got the pragmatic result and now the interesting scientific result about how does that depend on exactly the obvious, we just don't have an answer yet. Maybe, maybe uh, it's. I, I think that's. Uh, so we're very limited in how many things we could do, but I would love to somebody you know picking up on that because I think that would be really Probably exciting right. and it's a good way to look at it. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool.